Um, so it's so good to see you, and I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so excited that we're studying Colossians together, um, and how much we're going to see God grow our faith over the semester. It was um, asked of us if we would provide you the PowerPoint slides, which we are more than happy to do. So I'm going to just walk you really quickly through how to find the PowerPoint slides, because I know now that we don't give you a handout, it's a lot of information sometimes to capture all of this. So if you want to look at the PowerPoint slides after the teaching, this is what you need to do. So first you go to the church website. And um, you're going to click on, it'll say like uh, the top header will then say um, teachings. And you click on teachings and a drop down bar will come. And that drop down bar will say women's ministries. So you click on women's ministries. And when you do that, this page will come up. You've clicked teachings. And now as you click teachings, you'll see delighting in the Lord. And you, you, D-I-T-L is delighting in the Lord. By the way, that's our acronym. People are like, what's diddle? I'm like, yeah, that, that's delighting in the Lord. That's us, diddle. Okay, um, so click, click there and you'll see Colossians and then you'll see resources. It says videos, um, audio, and then resources. And then it'll say PowerPoint slides underneath there and that's how you find it. So if you have any questions, see us. It's pretty um, intuitive, honestly, the website. But if for whatever reason you can't find it, just let us know and we'll, we'll guide you through. All right, without further delay, let's get started. Um, prior to today, you probably always remember me saying, um, starting off every teaching, going, make sure you get a handout, right? So now our workbook provides you a place for notes, so you don't need a handout. So now we'll be saying, turn to page. And so today's page is 28. So turn to page 28, and you'll see there's a blank space there for you. Uh, the title of the message is Trees of Righteousness. And um, because you are all very bright women in here, I am sure you have probably caught on to the idea that Stacy and I are going to be doing some gardening themes in this study. That's kind of like the mega theme from, uh, you know, what we're kind of tying everything together with in this study. And I don't know, maybe it was the giant sprout or the name of the Bible study or, I don't know, the devotionals in the homework that gave you the tip off. We're going to be doing gardening this semester. Um, but... That's what I'm going to use as my hook today, too. I don't think every single teaching is necessarily going to connect to gardening, but today it will. And I'm going to be using the theme of trees and soil and erosion and roots as my hook into this um, first week. So I'm not sure when the last time you pushed a shovel into the ground and then stood in awe of the dirt you upturned. But that top layer of soil is some pretty special stuff. It's filled with microorganisms and nutrients, and without it, most of the planet's vegetation could not survive. And yet, did you know that erosion of our topsoil is the second biggest environmental problem that our world faces? If you're wondering, the first is world population. Just, you know, throwing that out there for you. Um, however, our topsoil and erosion problem is often ignored because as one professor from Cornell said, trouble is, who gets excited about dirt? right? But dirt is actually something we should think about. When soil erodes, it loses nutrients, clogs waterways, and with enough time, a once lush area will become a desert. So one way to slow erosion down and prevent landslides is to plant more mature native trees, especially along hillsides and slopes. Older trees are best for this job um, over, say, a sapling, right? A sapling because the older trees, are the roots are deeper, and they're going to be stronger and hold the soil more firmly in place. All right, so Paul, the author of Colossians, sort of reminds me of that more mature tree. And the church at Colossus, I think that's how I'm saying it, over, is that how we're saying it? Coloss, Colossus. We've been struggling and trying to figure out how to say this. I actually text or um, emailed Pastor Chris and I was like, how do you say this? And so apparently it is Colossus is how you say, we were saying Colossae, I guess is what we were originally saying, but that's not actually, I don't know. I've heard it pronounced several ways, but we're going to go with this one. Um, they were like saplings. All right, so Paul's more like that mature tree and the Colossians were more like a sapling because they, although they were believers, they weren't mature believers yet. Um, certainly not as mature as Paul. And so using this analogy, of course, everything's a visual for me. So I started to picture like a hillside and I started to think about it sort of like this. The church was experiencing soil erosion and their roots were not holding them steady. They were in need of a mature, strong tree, if you will, on their slope to help slow their erosion process. So Paul wrote to the church and included guidance on how to strengthen their roots and help support the soil of their faith. 
as you consider this visual for a moment, does someone come to your mind who was like a Paul in your own life? Did God ever plant a person near you who was an example of a mature Christian? Maybe you needed someone like a Paul to root next to you, encourage you, and build you up in your faith. When this occurs, it is as if God has provided a tangible example of his son, Jesus Christ, in flesh and blood as a person. And maybe without them, you would have had a landslide of your faith. I have been blessed to have a small forest of people who have stood with me and helped to keep my soil from eroding over the years, one of whom I will share with you at the very end of the teaching. But Paul was this kind of man to the Colossians. You may recall that this is not Paul's first letter. In one of his previous correspondences with the Corinthians, he made a remarkably bold statement about himself and said this about himself and his faith. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Okay, you're a pretty mature tree if you say that, because you will never hear me say that. I, I have so many flaws. I, that's the last thing you're going to hear out of me. I, certainly, that's my desire, but I wouldn't stand up here and tell you that. Um, but he felt so confident in his ability to be an example to others that he actually said that to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Paul had grown into a tree of righteousness in the image of God, and he encouraged others to follow his example. So as I thought about that, and I looked at these verses that we're in in Colossians, I thought to myself, is he providing an example for us somewhere in here? And I found three of them that I'm going to be focusing on this morning. The first one is doing God's will. The second one is being thankful. And the third one is being prayerful. And so I'm going to give you, don't have a heart attack when I show you this. There's a lot. I, and it's, I don't even know if you're, this is the first for me. I'm just going to say, I normally like give you my handout. I'm very excited to produce that thing. It helps me know where I'm going and give it to you. Now this week, I was like trying to figure out how I'm going to present this to you in a different way without a handout. So there are basically, if you're the kind of person that wants to write down every single thing I'm going to say, you can try to organize your sheet something like that. If you don't want to do that, it's totally fine. You can just sit here and enjoy it and take notes, don't take notes, whatever you want to do. Do your thing. You do you, whatever that looks like. But the three main points, the only thing I would say is this, the three main points you're going to hear me talk about is doing God's will, being thankful, being prayer for. So if you want to just put those three things on your paper, that's fine too. If you want to write it all down, that's where we're going. Okay. And I'll leave that up so that you guys can jot those things down. Those are the points if you wanted to follow along. And we're gonna fill them in, obviously, as we go through the teaching. And we'll see if this works. If this doesn't work, guess what? You'll be getting a handout, because I, I don't know. This just may not work for me either. Let's just see how it goes. All right, so before we dig any deeper, let's open up in prayer and ask God to help us as we begin the book of Colossians. Lord, I, I praise you and I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you that we are here. I thank you that this is not an empty room that I am teaching to, because when we did that last sem or in the um, in the spring of last year, almost a full year ago, that was um, that was really hard, Lord, because to see the ladies' faces, to be in fellowship, we were designed and created to be in fellowship with one another. And it was so hard for me, Lord, to be here without them. So I am so glad they're here. I'm so glad that we can meet face to face. And Lord, for those who are unable to be with us and are watching online, I ask that you would encourage them and strengthen them as isolation on the walls of our homes. Sometimes it's very challenging. I ask that you would bless them, especially those that are home today. And so, God, I ask that you would open up this book of Colossians to us. Lord, what a great book. There's so much here. I just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be the teacher, that I would fade into the distance, Lord, and that you would come forth, that your word would come alive to us, that you would speak loudly, minister to each room, person in this room, Lord, as if they're the only woman here. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to dive into... Colossians 1, I'm going to only read the first two verses to you, and then we'll take that and pull it apart a little bit. We're going to be verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we get our, our greeting here from Paul and Timothy, and that, that's who the letter is from. It's primarily Paul, obviously, speaking, and it's believed that Timothy may have been the person who wrote it down. Um, it's to the church at Colossus. 
the greeting, of course, is that Paul greets them with grace and peace, and that's a very common thread. If you read any of the other books that Paul has written, it almost always starts in some fashion like that, with grace and peace. And then he also adds other things, but it's, it's like a, almost like a red flag that it's from Paul. But what really caught my attention in these first two verses was this little word, will, that little tiny word, well. And I couldn't help but get, get past it. Like I just kept getting to verse one, I'd get to will and I'd have to stop. And I was like, the will, it was his will that he became an apostle. And if you know Paul's testimony and how he came to know the Lord, it definitely was God's will. I mean, he was on the road to Damascus as Stacy shared two weeks ago. It was definitely God's involvement in him becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. And so that word will, it was by God's will that Paul became an apostle. And we're going to see it again in verse 9. It jumps out again there. It's the same word. And it means God's desire for something to occur. And in this case, it was God's desire for Paul to become an apostle. All right, great. That's God's will for Paul. What's, what's God's will for you and I? What, 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 for you and me? What, what does that look like? And typically this topic comes up when we're trying to make a big decision, right? That's when we typically ask God for his input, right? If it's a big decision, like I'm going to move, going to take a different job, right? We better check with God. We don't ask him about the small stuff, do we, very often? And we, we should. He should be involved in the dialogue of prayer should be going all the time between us and the Lord. But it's usually the big things that we ask him about. And we want to know, Lord, am I in conf- give me a confirmation that I'm in step with your will, And based on our text this morning, I believe we'll be able to draw some conclusions that will give us some absolutes regarding what is God's will for your life and mine, goes for both of us, as well as to help know how to discern the will of God. Kind of two different things, but similar. All right, so the first thing I want to point out to you is it is absolutely, and this is going to go on this, um, on your underneath number one, under doing God's will. It is absolutely God's will that everyone come into a saving relationship with him and become his disciple. Like there's, there's no question. That is why Jesus came to the world in the first place, which was to save us from our sins so we could be forgiven and restored into fellowship with him. So it's absolutely God's will that we come into a saving relationship with him. And we're going to continue to fill in more of these do God's will as we go through. This is just the first one. But I found that here in verse 1. It's the will of God that all of us, not just Paul, who became an apostle, but us to become his disciples. So we're going to keep adding to this, but this is the first one. I'm going to jump now back into verses 3 and 4, and we're going to keep going. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Okay, instead of complaining about his imprisonment, Paul gives thanks to God for the Colossians and tells them he's been praying for them. Okay, if this was my letter the first time, I'd be telling you like, oh my gosh, the food stinks here, okay? Could you please bring me my computer? Those would be the things I'd be whining about immediately if I were the person in prison. And he says, I give thanks to God for you. I've been praying for you. He even commends them for the love they are extending to others when they first put their faith in Jesus. And these actions are other-centered, other-centered, not self-centered, other-centered. And Paul focuses on the eternal and not the temporal. And Paul sets an example for the believers that being grateful isn't something we only do when life is going swimmingly. But instead, we should choose to be grateful in every season of our lives. Thanksgiving and prayer should be an ongoing activity in a believer's life. It will help us to develop into trees of righteousness. So, let's look at Thanksgiving. Why not just complain? It's a whole lot easier. All right, let's talk about that. Let's go there for a minute. Why not? Right? Because our perspective, and this is under be thankful, our perspective changes. Thanksgiving alters it by taking our focus off of our problems and putting them onto God and the blessings that he has given us. This takes maturity and trust in God, not to complain, but probably more importantly, not to give up waiting on God to change our circumstances. No matter what we face as a believer, there's always something to be thankful for. And when we stop focusing on what is wrong and look for what is right, We will find it, and we can thank God for it. Paul's a great example of this. He expresses gratitude and encouraged others to be grateful, even from prison. 
Recently, a friend of mine, precious friend of mine, had an echocardiogram done, and although she did not receive great news, when she described it to me, she chose not to focus on what wasn't working, but on what was. She said to me, I was in awe of just watching my heart beat, and I was grateful for how well it had been working all these years. I was in awe of God and how he had created my heart. I'm so grateful for what is working, and I will trust God with what isn't. She's my glass half full friend. Everybody needs somebody like that. If you don't have a glass half full friend, find one. You need one. They're awesome. And in full transparency, I am not the half glass full woman. Yeah, I know probably you'd think I would be, but I'm not. I'm not typically that girl. And over my life, I've gotten better at it. Um, and I'm learning to be grateful in all circumstances. Um, but I often hid my complaining in sarcasm. I would be sarcastic and sometimes funny, but nonetheless sarcastic. And that was where I got my, you know, my complaints in. Funny, once I had children and my um, kids started complaining, that really got on my nerves. It really got on my nerves. And they would sit back there and I would look in the back seat of the car and I would listen to them complain. And I would think to myself, you people are so well provided for. What are you complaining about? And I would drive the vehicle and then I would play the gratitude game and I would look at them and go, okay, you're so complaining, your life is so horrible. Okay, I want you to give me, gratitude has nine letters. So I'd say, you have to give me nine things you're thankful for. And so we would drive and they would have to think and they would say the stupidest things. And I would think, oh my word, there are so many things for you to be grateful for right now. But okay, so they would have to go, oh, I'm thankful that I have you know, dinner. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what else, you know? So like I would go through this gratitude game. And then I started thinking to myself, I wonder how I sound to God being so well provided for and yet wah, 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 complaints, right? And then the Lord had me to hear, do you ever have this? You're struggling with something, maybe a lifetime of struggling with it. And then all of a sudden the Lord like hammers something home that you'll never forget. And you are like, Oh my word, that is what I have needed all of these years. And you heard it. I heard a teaching and this God had been working on me and working on me. And I heard this sermon and God got through to me like I'd never heard it before. He said to me, this, this pastor that was speaking, he was teaching on the West Coast. And he said, when we complain, we are in essence telling God, I deserve better than this. Yeah, let me say that again, because it hit me the same way. I went, oh. <laughs> like, when I complain, I am saying to God, I deserve better than this. I don't know about you, but that was really convicting, and that has stayed with me. I used to complain about the weather. I complained about whatever. It just, whatever it was, that just, just wasn't to my liking in that moment. And God was like, how about some gratitude? How about we play the gratitude game? How about you give me some nine things you're grateful for? Let's be careful about our ingratitude and how it sounds in God's ears. Now let's take a look at prayer because Paul gives us two things here. He gives us thanksgiving and he gives us prayer as an example. So why pray? I mean, there's lots of good reasons to pray. It's certainly better than complaining, right? So let's take a look. Why pray? Well, prayer helps other people. Remember, Paul has never met the Colossians and he was praying always for them. That challenges me. When I read that, I was like, how often do my prayers include people I have never met? Not very often. Do our prayers touch the world beyond who we know? Who are we always praying for? Do we pray for the persecuted church? How about missionaries? There's a whole wall of missionaries on the, on, out in the narthex, people you could pick, pick from that you never have met before. Doesn't matter, they still need prayer missionaries, and others around the world who need inter our intercession. I don't know if you're aware of this, but today is the Collegiate Day of Prayer in the United States. And um, when I initially signed up to pray, I was only thinking of my daughter at college, right? So I'm like, I'm signing up for her school, I'm praying up a storm for her school, right? Because that's what I would do because I know someone there. But they sent out an email and they showed how many college campuses had no one praying for them, no one. And they said, would you adopt another? And I was like, yeah. So I started going on there and I picked colleges surrounding where my home is. And I just picked 
more colleges and put my name in and, and I said I would pray for them. And I'm not telling you that because I'm so great. I'm just telling you that, that these are, this is a way that you can unleash the power of the almighty God on behalf of other people. That's what prayer does. And I think we have been so lulled into believing that it does nothing, that we are not engaging in it for other people's nor, people nor ourselves. It is absolutely vital that we employ prayer. And don't allow the enemy to tell you that it's a worthless activity, that it does nothing, that it accomplishes nothing. Oh no, that's a lie. Our faith is strengthened when we pray because it's our communication tool with God. It keeps us humble. I think it reminds us we are not in control. We have no ability to be in control. We can't take our next breath without God. And prayer changes us. I think that's the most important thing I've seen over the years. It doesn't always change my circumstances, but it changes me. Me, the one who needs it the most. I'm praying for somebody else to change, and God's like, how about you start with you? How about we work on you, and then I'll figure out that other thing, but you work on you. And the time that we spend with God, as he changes our perspective, he gives us discernment on things we may never have had without that silent time of prayer. You might be familiar with the little devotional called Our Daily Bread. We have some out in the Northex. Well, I thought this little snippet from the devotional captured well the power of prayer to change us when I read it. Um, and you know, those, the devotionals aren't very long, so they don't give a lot of detail. But he basically said, Ivan entered all, or endured all the horrors of a Soviet prison camp. One day he was praying with his eyes closed, and a fellow prisoner noticed him and said with ridicule, Prayer won't help you get out of here any faster. Opening his eyes, Ivan answered, I do not pray to get out of prison, but to do the will of God. Prayer doesn't always mean our circumstances are going to change, but we certainly do. And it is God's will that we pray. I want to go back to this idea of God's will for a moment. Paul wrote to First Thessalonians, First Th First 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, about the will of God. And it ties beautifully for where we are right here in Colossians. And it says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That word will here in 1 Thessalonians is the same will in Colossians 1 and 9, verses 1 and 9. You're going to see it again. So it is the will of God that we Rejoice always, we pray without ceasing, and we give thanks for everything. So under, um, it's number two, so it'll be two through four. Rejoice, pray, and in everything give thanks. All right, we're going to go now on to five and six, verses five and six. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of truth, or excuse me, in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it has also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. These verses, Paul commends the Colossians for their faith. When I ask you to think about someone who has been a tree of righteousness in your life in the beginning of the teaching, one of the reasons you may have remembered them was because of how they encouraged you. Paul compliments the Colossians right away regarding how their faith was bearing fruit. Fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is one of which is love, which he mentions in verse 4. But Paul also reminds them the gospel as a whole was bearing fruit, as people were hearing it. The gospel, which is good news about Jesus, is the word of truth. That's what he's saying here in these verses. Jesus Christ came to die so that we may have life. This good news had come to the Colossians and was spreading to the whole world. And once the gospel's heard, right, it bears fruit. And increases. And this fruit cannot be manufactured on, our, in, on its own, right? It just, once the Holy Spirit resides in you, it just pops out. Like you can't, you can't keep it in. It just, it just shows up. You can't help but be producing fruit. And Jesus explained this in John 15, 8. Jesus said this about fruit when he was teaching about abiding in him like a vine in its branches. He said, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Okay, so what's another thing that's God's will? We bear fruit. Let's go on to verses 7 and 8. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. 
Okay, so the gospel was taught to the Colossians by Epaphras, the same man who went to see Paul, traveled to see Paul. I think they said it was like a thousand miles from where he was to, to Rome. Um, to share the difficulties that the Colossians were facing as a church. It's believed that Epaphras first heard the gospel through Paul when he taught at Ephesus. But Epaphras then began the church at Colossus. Notice, though, how Paul describes him. A dear fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he said that Epaphras spoke well about the Colossians to him. I love that Paul says Epaphras spoke well of them. You know, Paul's going to have to include some tough stuff later. A little tough love is coming. And I love that he starts out with the idea that before I do that, I want you to know that Epaphras didn't talk ill of you. He spoke well of you. But these are some things we want to address, right? So I love that he sort of set them up like that and gave them some good stuff before he hit them with some things they need to change. So from these actions that, that Epaphras has, I think we have some more things we can decide that are also God, uh, God's will for us. That we share the gospel with others. Obviously, that's pretty straightforward. And that it's God's will that we serve him with our gifts that he has given us. Jesus told his disciples that it was their mission as he was leaving the earth in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. So this is God's will for us. It's pretty plain. He left us with this directive before, it's called the Great Commission, this directive that he gave before he left the earth. All right, so let's go on now to 9 through 12. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, with all patience and long suffering, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay, these four verses are so packed, I could have just sat here all morning, but I'm going to try to condense this down and give you some things from this. Paul prayed for the Colossian church. We talked before about why pray. Now we're going to look at what to pray. It's like he gave us a little formula here. It's beautiful. In the homework, Stacey had shared that she prayed these verses over her husband, these 9 through 12. And um, for the last several months, I've had these verses in my kitchen window as a reminder to pray them over my own husband. But I found that they encompass so many dimensions of the Christian life that they were perfect to pray over nearly anyone. I pray them over my daughter, my son, my family, my friends, right? I just, they, they fit Literally, I can't, I can't think of a circumstance they don't fit. It's a beautiful pattern prayer. And when our prayers include scripture, now I have to tell you, I almost brought with me all of these books I have on prayer because um, I, I lead a, a women's prayer group at my son's school and do some other things and they provide these little books and they're great and they're, they're fabulous and they're based on scripture. But I thought to myself, really what I want you to capture is the word of God is your best prayer tool. I mean, it's not to say that those aren't great resources. They are, and they help me tremendously, especially when I don't know what to, what to say, what to write. But the word of God, listen to this. So Johnny Erickson taught it. I thought she captured it so beautifully, why to use the word of God in prayer. She says, I have learned to season my prayers with the word of God. It is a way of talking to God in his language, speaking his dialect, using his vernacular, imploring his idioms. But this is not just a matter of simply dividing vocabulary. It's a matter of power. When we bring God's word directly into our prayers, we are bringing God's power into our prayers. Hebrews 4.12 declares, for the, word, um, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged uh, uh, double sword, two-edged sword either way. So whenever possible, I highly recommend praying scripture, just as we see here in chapter one. Paul said, this is what he prayed. I do not cease praying for you. I love this. he says, I do not cease praying for you. Do you recognize what that means? I do not cease. I do not stop praying for you. None doesn't mean he's prayed from 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It just means when he prayed, he remembered them. He said, I do not cease praying for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, there's that word again, in all wisdom and understanding. Interestingly, this word will 
does not just mean, right, there's this word will, but what he's saying is this, this, this idea of accumulating knowledge is not just to get knowledge so that you have, that so you're so smart. That's not why he says it. He said rather that that knowledge would help you to discern the will of God. In order to gain this knowledge, we have to read and study the Bible. So in two places in your notes, I've written that under eight, it's read scripture to help discern as well. But then I also put it down, put it on the next one, yeah. What to pray is to pray the knowledge of God's will. So there's two places I wanted to put that. We should pray for God's will and the knowledge to understand it. And also then to read scripture to help discern God's will. So Paul prays for the Colossians to know the will and all wisdom and understanding so that we can do what God is asking us to do. So what happens when you have a situation and you're like, Lord, I really need specifics. I understand all of these wonderful things Brenda's given us here. You know, I should be in a saving relationship. I should rejoice. I should pray. I should bear fruit. I should share the gospel. I should serve. I should read scripture. Great. But I need to know what college I'm supposed to go to, Lord. Where, where, where do you want me going? And I, I have a lot of good options in front of me, right? And when this happens, when we get to a place where we, we need to know specifically which direction to take, here's my best counsel. Obviously, number one is to pray, and we've already identified that. But I heard Pastor Chris explain it this way. Pray down both roads, okay? Um, mom, I didn't ask for your permission. But we did this when my mom was getting ready to move. We, we prayed down both roads. Stay in her house move to this other location. And it was very hard because we didn't really have a piece about either one at the time. And so we waited. That's the other thing. As you pray down both roads and you ask God, will you please show me which road I'm to go down? Sometimes if you don't hear anything, that can mean, wait, just wait. And that's what we did with my mom. We waited a little while and God made it very clear eventually. But as you pray down both roads, see where God gives you peace. Where does he give you the most peace? And if you can't have peace, don't move. Hold on, because God may have other things in the works for you. The second thing I'm going to tell you is as you wait, ask God to speak to you through his word. And this is the other thing I was praying for my mom. I was like, God, give her a verse. Give her something, Lord, to give her some direction to know that this is the place where to go. And we would ask, Lord, speak through your word. Ask him to give you a verse or a portion of text that gives you direction. But remember this, and this is the most important thing I want you to hear about God's will. Even though the Bible will not tell you the name of the college to attend, the Bible will tell you what God wants from you no matter what college you go to. God's word will not give you the first and last name of the person he wants you to marry, but he's going to give you guidelines for the kind of person you are to marry. The Bible will not tell you to change jobs, but it will tell you how he desires you to live no matter what job you are working the Holy Spirit will often give gentle guidance toward a decision, but look to God's word as the source for the way to live no matter what decision you're trying to make. We want specifics, but God's more concerned with the big picture of glorifying him no matter where we are. God's will is not always one spot on a map. Sometimes it's just more important that we focus on being the Christian that he desires us to be while we seek him for his will. So what else should we pray for other people? Well, verse 10 tells us that you, we should pray that we would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So these are more things we can pray for the people in our lives. And those are um, two, three, and four on the, on the screen. The more increase in knowledge of God, the more we can walk worthy of him, please him, and be fruitful. These are areas I feel everyone, no matter what your circumstances, can pray for. Pray for me. If you don't have anybody to pray for, pray for me. Pray that I would do these very things, that I would walk worthy of the Lord, be fully pleasing to him, being fruitful, increasing in the knowledge of God. You can pray those for me. And Paul prayed them for the Colossians. He also prayed that they would be strengthened with all might in accordance with this glorious power for patience and long suffering with joy. You can particularly pray these for me when I explain this, what these verses are indicating. I don't know if you captured this and I don't know if we caught it as well as we could have in the homework. But when I studied this section, I was really, really blown away at what I learned here. Why do we need strength with all might to be patient and long-suffering? 
Do you think about that at all? Did anybody, did that catch anybody in a weird way? It caught me in a weird way. And I thought, what is that? That word strength being used here is dunamis, which means might. This power comes from the Holy Spirit, which we saw in Acts 1.8. This word is used when describing Jesus's power to perform miracles, healings, control demons, and ultimately his victory over death. But guess where else it's used? This is so cool. It's just to describe the way Jesus will return to earth with power, with dunamis. He's coming back with dunamis. And guess what? That power lives in you and me. If you have the Holy Spirit, you got that kind of power living inside of you. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? I don't know. I get really excited when I think about that. Not because I'm power hungry, but because I need help. I need help to be patient. I need help to be long suffering, right? I, somebody said this uh, that I read. This. We, need, we need patience with people. We need long suffering in circumstances. And then I'm supposed to do it with joy. I'm supposed to do it with joy. I love that. I need strength. I don't know about you, but I need strength to do that. I need that dunamis power if I'm going to do that. And finally, Paul prays that they would give thanks to the Father who has qualified them to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. Paul desires them to be grateful for their salvation. And ladies, if we don't have anything else we can think about that we want to be thankful for, we should be thankful for our salvation. The God of this universe loves you. He loves you. If that doesn't cause some gratitude in there, I don't know. Come see me afterwards and we'll talk. Oh my goodness, that, that's so powerful when you think about that, how much he loves you. So be grateful for your salvation. So then we get into these last two verses. Let's read them. It says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Okay, these two verses are a transition to the second half of this chapter. And we stop here because Stacy's going to pick up here next week. But before we go there, I want to, these are like pivotal verses in this chapter. And this is, I wanted to share with you, when you think back to Stacy's introductory teaching, she gave us this term that I, I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's um, Christology. And she, she touched on that. And it's one of the mega themes in the book of Colossians. Christology means the person, nature, and role of Christ. And it stresses two questions. Who is Jesus? And what has he done for us? Well, if you look at these verses, and this is the transition we're about to make here, these two verses, we find the answers to these questions. Who is he? He's our redeemer. What has he done for us? He's rescued us from Satan's power. He allows us to share in the inheritance of his son. We, his, his blood, Jesus' blood purchased our freedom from sin and restored us to a relationship with God. And in doing so, we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And Stacey's going to pick up here next week and do more regarding this whole Christ preeminence. That's where we're headed next. Mine's sort of like the, hey guys, it's Paul, right? That's kind of like my section. Stacey's going to take us into this major like section of Christ's preeminence and how his life and what he accomplished for us is the central theme of this entire book. And you're not going to want to miss it. As we get ready to con wrap up this morning, I want you to again go back for a minute with me and think about the person that I asked you, who was that mature tree that God planted in your life? Who was that Paul to you? A person who prayed for you, thanked God for you, did their best to follow God's will for their life so they could imitate Christ to you? Well, one of mine is this precious lady here. That is my grandmother, that is my mother's mother, and the little sprout, not even a sapling yet, is me. And yes, apparently I've always had a lot of hair. Um, I guess I came out that way. Um, but this is my grandmother. And um, she was a tree of righteousness for sure. She was widowed at 43 and lived to 96. She never remarried. She lived a good portion of her life beside a little lake in Michigan. And she was, lived a very quiet life there. She hunted and fished and prayed a lot. I forget how many Bibles we found in her house when... Um, we cleaned her house out after she passed away. I don't even know, but all of the grandkids got a Bible. Like pretty much anybody, and there was tons of grandkids, and pretty much anybody, there were so many Bibles that we found that everybody got their own. She was amazingly patient, loving, resourceful, and she made awesome 
pie. When I tell you awesome pie, like, like crazy delicious pie. I don't know. I don't know like how that happened, but she just, it was like magical. Anyway, the year I was born, my grandmother came to visit twice. And after her second visit, she penned a letter to me that I found recently and along with it, a poem that I will read to you. I'm sharing this because the poem and letter echo so much of what I hear from Paul to the Colossians. And as you listen, I hope you'll hear her heart of prayer toward, for me, her love, her affirmation, as well as her deep gratitude to God. So this is what she wrote. I just have to show you this. Do you ever look back on the handwriting of people who have passed away and you have like a warm, fuzzy feeling? I have a warm, fuzzy feeling when I look at this because it's just like, it's, it's her handwriting and her words. So um, anyway, Brenda Kay. That's, dear Brenda Kay, that's my middle name. I came to your house awaiting your arrival. Oh, what a thrill to see you with your long black hair, small dainty fingers and toes. You were so cute, I could hardly wait to get a picture of you to bring home with me. And apparently, that's the picture she took home with her. Six and a half months later, I saw you again, a sweet, lovable baby with your first tooth and almost sitting up alone. You put your arms around my neck. I was even a hugger then. I put your, put your arms around my neck and snuggled, which was a precious moment. You are more precious than jewels and to be treasured even more, which I am sure you will be by your loving parents and brother. My prayer for you, Brenda, is that God will guide your life and your footsteps through this life and you will live for him. I have composed the following poem, which you have inspired me to write. Well, I wasn't doing what I do now when she died. <laughs> so I hope that she has some kind of a glimpse to see her prayers were answered. This was the poem that she wrote. Babies. Babies are like flowers blooming in the sun. Each endearing thing you do, a joy to everyone. Each winning smile, a fragrance. Each touch, a treasure rare. Each step you take, a milestone with soft breezes in your hair. With each look into your eyes, a love is born within. We look to God above with thankfulness to him. You are like a fragrant rosebud, giving spe special joy to me, because your mother is my rosebud, giving off new little rosebuds, now for all the world to see. This makes you my granddaughter, and I'm as proud as I can be, to have you in their garden and on my family tree. And so that, like, isn't it cute how, like, poetry was a thing? That's so cool. So I share that with you because I thank God for those who have been the trees of righteousness in our lives. Whoever that is for you, whoever you may be for someone else, that's the big thing I want you to think of. You are being that tree of righteousness, perhaps, for someone else. Maybe you don't even know it. Maybe you are that woman. Someone is intently watching beside you. If you are a grandparent, I especially want to encourage you that although my grandmother did not know where the Lord would lead me in this life, the prayers that she prayed in 1970 have come true. Roots can take two to seven years to break down after a tree dies. So if you think about that, those things that are planted, those roots that are established and used to hold the soil in place can hang around for quite a while. And sometimes they sprout forth new shoots that come up from the roots that are left behind. And that vast network gives stability to the ground. So even as you think about what you're doing, the consciousness of what you do every day, whether that's silently praying at home, whether that's taking the time to show thanksgiving for what God has given you, to be that witness to someone who needs some encouragement. Shoots come off the roots, girls. Paul's legacy left roots and shoots. He was a tree of righteousness. Let's keep going. Let's keep doing God's will. Let's keep praying. Let's stop, not stop being grateful. Lord, I praise you and I thank you, God, for this, this text. I thank you that it was very challenging to me personally. There was much that I gleaned from just these, four, just these first 14 verses. God, there's a lot in this book. 
And when we take it and we parcel it out so carefully as we are and taking it slowly and looking one verse at a time, God, how I pray that you would meet the women right where they are. That God, in the quiet, in the silence, that they'll hear your voice and know your will. I pray that as they open your word, you will show them how to walk, how to be fully pleasing, how to glorify you. And as they show gratitude, it would speak so loudly in a world full of criticism and anger and violence, Lord, that we can choose to be grateful in all things, rejoicing always in all things. So God, please help us. We do need dunamis. We need power to do what you're asking us to do. But you didn't tell us to do it on our own. You provided it through the power of the Holy Spirit. May we tap into that, Lord. May we use it to its fullest extent so that we may honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.